Well, here we go. The great sustainer. Don't you appreciate that worship team? Just love. Love their heart, man. If you're visiting with us, you've not been around for a while, it would have to be a long while because we've been in the great sustainer for uh, a minute now. Psalms 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. What a promise from God's word. I'm gonna speak to you just again this, this morning on the subject of he sustains us with the spirit of truth. Now, you know, I, I preach out of the New King James Version uh, most every sermon Sunday, but as I studied this text, I began to study it in different versions, and I believe the Amplified Classic just helps us, especially if you're new to the Bible, it just helps expand. You know, in the West, Western culture, we have um, one word where the Hebrew or Greek would have eight or nine words. I used love as an ex- as example last week. You know, I love my wife, but I love Lucky Charms. <laughs> yeah, hurt, hurt, you, know, you you stump your toe and man, that hurt. Or you get a bunch of guys together who are old in body, but up here, they still think they got it, you know? Like tomorrow, this will happen somewhere, and somebody will have a football, and they'll say, hey, you guys wanna play football, and they'll start out all fun, and then, hey, y'all wanna play tackle football, and somebody will say, let's say, yeah! And then, you know, if somebody hits you and your shoulder's dislocated, that hurts, you see what I'm saying? But we got one word for that. My toe, that hurt, that's gone. My shoulder? whole different level of hurt. So what the Amplified Version does is it just kind of expands on certain words, good? So I'm not gonna read, I'm not gonna read the New King James um, in this service. I'm just gonna go straight to the Amplified. Let me read it and then, then we'll pray. So 1 John 4, one through six. Beloved, and this is, we got through verse four last week, so just recap. Beloved, do not put faith in every spirit, but prove, test the spirits to discover, discover whether they proceed from God. For many false prophets have gone forth into the world. By this you may know, to know, to perceive and recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit which acknowledges and confesses the fact that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, actually has become man and has come in the flesh is of God has God for its source. And every spirit which does not acknowledge and confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, but would annul, destroy, sever, disunite him, is not of God, does not proceed from him. This non-confession is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you heard that it was coming and now is already in the world. Little children, You are of God, you belong to him and have already defeated and overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist, because he who lives in you is greater, mightier than he who is in the world. They proceed from the world and and are of the world, therefore it is out of the world. It's, watch this, his whole economy morally considered that they speak and the world listens, pays attention to them. We are children of God. And we we won't get through all this, but I, I wanna read it. We are children of God, whoever is learning to know God. Well, what does that mean? To progressively perceive, recognize, and understand God by observation and experience and get an ever clear knowledge of him listens to us, and he who does not, who is not of God, does not listen or pay attention to us. By this we know, recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for Quinley, Clint and Jenny and that family. But thank you that church was your idea. We celebrate Pentecost Sunday, the day the church was birthed by your spirit, Lord. And so I pray you would take this word today and change our lives 
God, we don't desire to waste time here today. We want a transaction. We want to be changed. Remove me. I've got nothing good to say outside of your word, but I pray that you would change us by your word today. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. The church said, Amen. thank you, James. So John, you got 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, but you also have the gospel of John, all written by the disciple John. When you, when you get to the first and second and third book of John, so there, 1 John was written between 80 and 95 AD. So John is old by this point, and he is writing to believers. You have to understand this. It's very important you understand he's writing to believers because it helps us tie together how relevant the Bible is in 2023. I want you to see this. Not long after Jesus has been crucified, Jesus has come up, come back to life, people have seen him, documentate, like it's done already. John is having to write to the church, to believers, instruction on how to recognize truth. Because from the very beginning, the enemy knew if I can just shift truth a little bit, then 2,000 years later in 2023, truth will be way off course. So John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is now writing 1 John, and he is talking to believers. He is defending, not that God needs to be defended, he is sharing his observation and his experience as a disciple of Jesus Christ, one who walked with him, one who talked with him, one who camped out with him, one who, who was with him, the very one who actually went to the cross. And so now you read this and you think, and I love, I love this because people will tell you, you don't believe the Bible, do you? That archaic, that old book, you believe that? You believe all that stuff written on? What does that have to do with us today? Aren't we smarter than that? Do we really need a book that old to t teach us how to live? So, <laughs> but this could have been written yesterday, right? Because what's going on in our world today is, is what has been going on is coming to a head and it's a culmination of years of just little truth, truth being shifted just a little bit until now today we live in a day where there is no truth, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, and however you're feeling that day is true. Now you can't change truth. Can't add to it, can't take away from it, can't morph it, truth is truth. And so John is helping us understand. So you need to understand that, and then before we dive much deeper, you need to understand this. We have to know that when he says, of the world, and of the world and do not of the world. And when you hear me say world today, obviously I'm not talking about people of the world. We know that. For God so loved the world. Now we're talking about the moral economy, the systems, the, the shift, the spirit of the Antichrist that would come in and say, you know what, let's just change that a little bit so down the road it's changed a lot. To the point now where we have churches who have got so tired of living in the tension. Listen, it's not easy to pastor these days. It's not easy. It's not easy to, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth because it's not popular. But if we're really going to live up to what God's called us, who God's called us to be, and be the light of the world and be the salt of the earth, then we've got, watch this, we've got to learn to live in the tension as a, as a Christian, a man or woman of God. We've got to learn to live in the tension between truth and grace. Jesus, the word became flesh, truth became flesh, God, and dwelt among us, full of truth and grace, grace and truth, truth and grace, grace and truth. How, how do we stay true to truth Yet, 
be loving towards someone and be graceful. That's the tension, isn't it? Because it's so much easier to not tell someone the truth and call that love. See, if I love you and you're involved in a lifestyle or a habit or a relationship or anything that's bad for you and this book says it's bad for you and you know it's, it's going to a bad place, if I love you, Watch this, because we're not even getting to verses seven, eight, and nine today where it says, if you, if you don't love, you don't know God. Well, you gotta read up to verse six before you can get seven, eight, and nine. So as we've allowed truth to be redefined, watch this, we've redefined love. We've redefined love as not offending people. Well, mm, let's just don't talk about that, because that's offensive. Look. If you don't talk about the whole thing, you don't deserve to talk about any of it. But you can't do it in anger. Your Facebook rants about certain people and and how, that's not helping anybody, right? Take the Christian bumper sticker off your car. Uh Uh-uh, if you can't control yourself, like in traffic. (laughs) That's why I don't have any bumper stickers. I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Just joking. So the the tension's always been around to hang on to the truth. The question is, Jesus modeled how to do that. You do it in grace. But you don't trade in the truth because if you trade in the truth, you trade love with it. So if I love you, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Good? So we got up to verse four last week, and so let's just jump into this in verse five. Number one, the spirit of error is exposed by its fruit. A tree shall be known by its fruit. Again, if you tell me you're gonna take me on an outing, and we're going to an apple orchard, and we're gonna have apple cider, and we're gonna have apple pie, and we're Bob for apples, and we're gonna have sliced apples and green apples and red apples. And we turn the corner and we go up a hill and we come down, the apple orchard's supposed to be right over the hill and I see a bunch of trees full of, and it looks orange. Uh, You lied to me, because this is an orange grove, not an apple tree farm. Why? Because there's oranges all over the trees. Fruit defines the tree, right? So. So the spirit of error will be exposed by its fruit. First John 4, 5, we just read it. This is the New King James Version. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. D- don't you know the world has its own language, right? It's the, the world's, well, let me read it and then again, one more time. Yeah, you go. They proceed from the world and are of the world, therefore it is out of the world. This blew me away. It's whole economy morally considered that they speak in the world, listen, pays attention to them. So the systems of Babylon, the systems of the world, the systems that are created morally are created to reach a certain goal that is supposed to be gratifying. Well, what are we trying to gratify? I'm so glad you asked, because John answers this in 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Amplified says it like this. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, craving for, sen- craving for sensual, sensual gratification, and the lust of the eyes, greedy, greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life, assurance in one's own resources, are in the stability of earthly things. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world. See how the Amplified helps there? So now I'm living in a world that has its own moral economy. And within that moral economy, the, the, the goal is to gratify 
the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and pride of life. So I'm raised in a world that, that says, hey, if you want it, you should have it, and anyone that tells you you shouldn't have it, they don't love you. That's not love. What if we raised our kids that way? Then, you know, lust of the eyes. I love how it says, pays attention. Do you know that when you think about something, you're paying, it costs you to think? My grandson, who is seven, my oldest grandson, who is seven, was in town. Uh, he was in the first service, and, and they're on the way back home. Um, always hate saying goodbye. But he and my daughter were here. And so I am always try to be, always be very intentional with him when he's here because I get a limited amount of time with him. So we go for a walk yesterday. And so I live in Melbourne Beach, and so we're walking, and we're walking towards the beach. Just go over and, and look at the beach. And, and so he's old enough now where I said, hey, what are, the, what are the top three things you've been thinking about? You should ask your kids that as they get older. Ask them what they're thinking about. Because what they're thinking about is, is where they're living. It's what they're paying attention to. Now, I'm not going to tell you what he told me. That's between me and him. <laughs> but it was so cool because... It led into this conversation. I, I said, Jack, what, what's our most precious resource? He said, what's resource? I said, what's, what's the most important, like, what, what can you not, like, you know, resource? Like, and he goes, is it, is it money? And he stopped. And I said, well, if you were 80 years old and someone came up to you and offered you $100 million, which to him, $100 million is all the money in the world, or 80 more years to live, which one do you think they would choose? And he's just seven years old, right? And he says, well, of course, they would choose to live 80 more years. I said, so you're telling me that time is more valuable than money. And he wasn't too sure about that because he's not 80 yet, but... Or 50. <laughs> well, what am I saying? I'm saying that when you think about something, you're paying to it, to pay attention. So the world's moral economy has set up a system to work you, and you have to work it, right? Do you know our country is the only country that by the time you're 23 years old, if you don't have a four-year degree and kind of think about where you're headed or you're going for your next degree, or and when you're 28, if you don't have a career path, you're a failure. Only free country, I should say. So where, where did that come from? I mean, I, I'm not against education. I got several degrees but they don't, they don't make me, right? And so that's a system. I'm, I'm just using that as an example. That's a system that, that we've created. Now, now we conform to that to gratify a certain status that will then get us a certain job that we don't even like, that will then get us a bigger paycheck that gets us more stuff so we can have confidence in our own resource. When John said that's the pride of life, which brings us all the way back to the great sustainer. There is no other resource for a child of God except for God. I'm telling you, man, I know lots of people who have lots of things and lots of money, but when all hell breaks loose, it's not that that gets them through. It's their relationship with Jesus Christ that has been forged in the secret place, and they know that they know that they know that he is their resource. You, you take John as is, is helping us here, and you think about when he says, for all that is of the world, the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, and you, you think about how much time we spend, where we put our attention, 
you know, well, our staff had the opportunity to be together for a couple days this past week, and it was precious. It was just precious. And when I say be together, we work together, but we're hardly ever all together. Um, and, you know, you used to say, um, the, one of the gentlemen who, who was speaking to us, Pastor Ron, one of the elders of our church, him and Kelly came in, and they did just a fabulous job of just pouring into us. And he said, you know, people used to say, show me your checkbook, and I'll show you what's important to you. <laughs> well, like, now, who's got a checkbook anymore? <laughs> like, where's it? What's a checkbook? Yeah. I have a checkbook. I can't ever find it when I'm trying to write a check, right? I know we, like, they still make it. They still make checkbooks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, take your smartphone sometimes, and your smartphone's got a little thing on there that'll pop up and show you where, where you've been looking at, what you've been looking at most. And some of you are like, it's the Bible app. <laughs> I'm just having some fun because this is some heavy stuff, right? Is it, is it Instagram? Is it, you know, like what is it? What is, like what is taking your attention? So the spirit of error produces fruit. And watch this. Here's the fruit that it produces. It produces fruit that'll wear you out. You try to get and do and be everything the world says you need to get and do and be, and I will show you an exhausted, worn out, at some point addicted person who is miserable in their own skin and in their own palace because they're so tired. I love the story of the guy who's been out fishing. First of all, you can stop right there. Great story, guy goes fishing. (laughs) <laughs> I used to do that. <laughs> yeah, he comes back and it's only nine o'clock and there's a guy who sees him come back and he's, he's cleaning his fish. You know, this guy's sitting on the dock and he watches him come in. It's only nine o'clock and the guy says, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm cleaning these fish because I'm gonna sell them. Well, why are you selling them? Because that's how my family. It, and the guy goes, well, why are you back so early? He said, well, I've got enough fish. To, and the guy said, well, why didn't you stay out and get more? And the guy said, why? He said, so you can make more money. He said, why? He said, so you can buy more boats. Why? So you can catch more fish. Why? So you could spend every day fishing. And the guy goes, that's what I do. So the economy, morally speaking, of the world will just wear you out. The reason it will wear you out, and remember, he's talking to believers. If you're a Christian, the reason that will wear you out is because it creates a dichotomy in you that's trying to serve two gods. And the Bible is very plain that you cannot do that. You can't. So this is not a message about money or stuff. This is about affection. This is about what you're thinking about. This is a message about discerning a spirit of error. So if you're tired today and you're worn out today and you're weary today, then you need to ask this question, what am I sowing to? Because if I'm sowing to the the moral economy of the world, Galatians 6, 8 says, that if I'm sowing to the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, I'm gonna reap back corruption. That word corruption right there is decay. It's, it's weird, it's ah. But if I'm sowing to the spirit, I'm gonna reap from the spirit, ooh, everlasting life, like life abundantly. I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a little, I'm gonna have some energy that's not of my own. I'm gonna have a, a well that's a little bit deeper. I'm gonna make it through dry seasons, not on my own, because I'm reaping back from what I've sown in previous seasons. See, seed time harvest. And so I can sow a seed of faithfulness in, in a calm season. So when I hit a season that's a little bumpy, God said, no, that crop from that season that you sow when things were good in your life, right now you need that joy. You need that peace. 
You need that patience. So I'm gonna let that come up in this season, even though you sowed it in that season, because you've not been sowing to the flesh, you've been sowing to the spirit. The spirit of error will be judged by its fruit. Its fruit is exhaustion. Its fruit is dysfunction. Its fruit is, is, is addiction. But, but the fruit of the spirit, oh, it's love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Against such thing, there is no law, because who wouldn't want that? So, number two, I, the shift, though, you can go to number two, you can just stay there, you don't have to, the shift is a mind change shift, right? If you're on a, a big ship, and let's just say you're the captain of that ship, I mean, I'm talking about like a big ship, a cruise ship, and you forgot your phone. So you got to, you got to turn around and go back and get your phone. Like, it's not like you're, a, you're gonna on your boat and you can hit, you know, one engine forward, one reverse, and just whoop, and go home, get your phone, and then go about your business. Now, now to change, to turn that, a, 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 large, a very large ship is a process, but it, it starts, the process starts with determining which direction you want to go and where you want to end up. And then you begin to work the engines of that ship in such a way that it would turn that ship slowly to the desired destination, the desired direction of the destination. But it takes, it, it takes time. Like you can't just whoop. So if some light bulbs start coming on today in your heart, in your mind, and you think, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm worn out, but I'm starting to see that maybe I'm just paying. Then, then don't beat yourself up, right? You are where you are. It's okay. Like, it's, it's okay. But if you want more, joy in your life, if you want more of the fruit of the spirit in your life, if you want more freedom in your life, if you want less stress in your life, if you you don't wanna worry, if you wanna let go of anxiety, if that's your goal, then you've got to renew. You gotta change the way you're thinking. In other words, you've gotta change what thoughts you're paying because you're paying attention to something. So, Romans 12, 2, and the New King James says, no longer be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, how do we renew our minds? The word of God. See, when, when you read the book that was written by the spirit of God, by God, and the spirit in you bears witness with the spirit who wrote this book, then what happens is the spirit of truth begins to produce its own fruit. And so, number two, the spirit of truth will sustain you through the ever-growing knowledge of his voice. And again, we'll tear this apart at some more, in more detail, but for time's sake today, we'll just go into it a little bit. We are of God, he who knows God hears us. He who does not know God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The amplified version says this. We are children of God. Whoever is learning to know God. I guarantee you, somebody watching online right now or several of us in this room have asked this question. If not this last week or last month, at some point in our life, I wish I just knew how to know God more. We've all asked that question, right? I I just wanna know, how do I know him more? Well, to progressively perceive, recognize, and understand God by observation and experience and to get an ever clearer knowledge of him. I can observe church. I can observe the Bible from a standpoint of, man, I I know I gotta read my Bible today, right? And some days you do feel like that. And on those days, read your Bible. 
It's like, yeah, we're not always going to wake up out of bed going, ooh, it's getting way to. No, some days it's methodical, but that's okay. Do it. Because you're driving a pylon. So you can observe, but think about this. If you've ever been to an NFL game, how many of you have been to an NFL game? Awesome. How many of you know what the NFL is? <laughs> the National Football League. So, <laughs> know your audience. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. A lot of you have. Well, it's, it's pretty awesome. First of all, you, gotta, you got the best of the best. You got just genetic freaks who are fast and strong, and, but they're also fast and strong. They don't look that fast and strong until you go in person. And not just go in person, but get you, you gotta, don't sit up in a skybox and eat food and drink drinks during the football game. Get you like 10 rows up on the 50 yard line, right? Get, get to where you can hear the, 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 the coach talking uh, to the players. You know, you gotta get right there in it. And you can observe that and, and you can kind of get a taste See, the closer, the closer, you kind of get a taste and you can hear those pads hitting and you can hear the crunching. And then you realize, man, you get that guy in space and he's gone. And that's observation. But what if, what if, Clint, you're sitting on a 50 yard line and they call your number and they say, Clint, come on down here. And they put a helmet on him and shoulder pads, and they put you under center. And you're looking at all these people who are gonna kill you. Yeah. And you're like, I wanna go back to my seat. That's a whole different, hut, hut. See, what you did is you just experienced the game. And when you go from observation to experiential, it's a whole nother level. See, there's a whole nother level of Christ that the church is uncomfortable with. See, some of you, I, I feel it sometimes. We'll be in worship, like that last song we were in worship, and you, know, you just feel push, like let's go a little longer, and I can just feel some of you going, hmm, it's about four minutes longer than we usually go. Hmm. When at the football game, you're praying for overtime. You done paid to park. Don't dare ask for free coffee. Ain't nobody gonna watch your kids and teach them good stuff. Anyway. <laughs> so, when, when you begin to turn the ship, you begin to renew your mind. When you begin to renew your mind, you begin to hear, not just hear, but you experience an intimacy with Jesus that you never knew existed. And he becomes your Jesus. Not your mama's, not your daddy's, not your grandma's, not your grandpa's, yours. The best way I know to illustrate this is, is just out of Jesus' own mouth in John chapter 10. John chapter 10 is an amazing chapter, and Raina and I will both tell you this. Anytime someone first gets saved, you know, and if, if you're not going to get, let us disciple you, and if you're not from here or whatever, we'll get you a Bible. And if you ever ask, where should I start reading, we'll just tell you the book of John. Just start in the book of John. Not 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, the gospel of John. So in the Gospel of John, same John, ver, uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 14, I assure you, which is funny because Jesus is assuring. It's like when somebody starts a conversation and, and say, they're like, honestly. You're like, okay, so what have you told me that's not honest? Like, honestly. Anyway, Jesus says, surely, most solemnly, I tell you, he who does not enter by the door into the sheepfold but climbs up some other way elsewhere from some other quarter is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. 
The watchman, remember that word, opens the door for this man and the sheep listens to his voice and heed it and he calls his own sheep by name and brings and leads them out. If you've ever seen this happen, it's one of the most amazing things because what would happen is when, it, when the weather was bad or, or the sheep needed to be put up for a while, you didn't just put your sheep up most of the time. You would take their, their different spots, huge hewns in the rocks in, in certain places that had watering holes and different shepherds would all, watch this, they would all bring their sheep into this place for the night or for the week or whatever. So there's a bunch of different sheep. They're all sheep, but they have different shepherds. See, unless you understand that, this makes no sense. You're like, why are you telling us this? Well, Jesus is talking to a lot of people who understand this. You understood the football analogy. I want you to understand this. So what would happen is the shepherd would go in and you got a thousand sheep, but only 249 are his. He would speak and his sheep would follow. And he would lead them out of, but watch this, when he has brought out his own sheep, he walks on before them and they, the sheep follow him because they know his voice, spirit of truth. More you get to know this book and the spirit of God inside of you resonates with the spirit of God that wrote that book, you're gonna practice his presence more and more and you're gonna learn to hear the voice of truth, the voice of God. It's so beautiful. They will never on any account follow a stranger, spirit of error, but will run away from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers or recognize their call. Are you getting this? So a shepherd can go to a group of a thousand sheep and by just saying, hey, sheep, I don't know, whatever, like, I was about to start making up names, but I won't do that. Hello, this is your shepherd. Hey, follow me. 249 sheep separate from 1,000. But, but the other ones that are left, right, 751, help me with the math, is that right? 752, if there's 249, 751, whatever. <laughs> they not only don't come, they run because the voice is strange. And what we do when we trade in the voice of truth at the expense of not offending someone is we confuse people on who they're supposed to be following. Dear Lord, and that's what's happening in our world today. That's why this could have been written yesterday for the church. Now some parts of the world today are making it so easy it's just common sense. Like, that's wrong. What you're doing is just wrong. But how did we get to this point? We got to this point because the church started caring more about filling seats and offering plates than they did about telling the truth. And the truth is what sets people free. The truth is what brings freedom. The truth is what brings families back together. The truth will restore your marriage. The truth will help you in finance. See, the truth. Jesus used this as a parable. that They didn't understand what he was talking about. And this is the disciples, I love that. Verse seven. So Jesus said again, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, that I myself am the door for the sheep. All others who came as such before me are thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to and obey them. I am the door. Anyone who enters in through me will be saved. All roads don't lead to heaven, friend. He will come in and he will go out freely and will find pasture. The thief, the one who comes in outside of truth, comes only in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Watch this. Then Jesus says these most amazing words. I came 
that they, you and I, may have and enjoy life and have it to abundance, to the full, till it overflows. You don't serve a God that wants you to, 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 to not have fun and not do stuff and not like, man, I tell you what, there's some, I grew up in a church there for a while. Like if you, you, if you had fun, it was wrong. I mean, it's much easier to disciple someone who has had nothing to do with church than someone who was raised in church in a wrong way. Like, because you got to unlearn what you thought was right because you never read this and somebody was teaching this. They had their own issues, so they weren't telling the truth. Anyway, <laughs> Jesus, God himself says, I want you to have life. I want you to, have, I want you to enjoy life. I want you to have a full life. I want you to catch up. Yeah, I, I, want you to, I want you to enjoy life and enjoy it to the full while you're at it. Now, don't just, uh, I'm not overflowing deluge of enjoyment, abundance, laugh a little. Come on, you know, just have some fun. Why don't you let the Holy Spirit lead you in having a little fun? He says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd risks and lays down his own life for his sheep, but the hired servant, he who merely serves for wages, who is neither the shepherd nor the owner of the sheep, when he sees the wolf coming, deserts the flock and runs away. And the wolf chases and snatches them and scatters the flock. We have a scattered generation because the church stopped telling them the truth because we don't wanna hurt anyone's feelings. Listen, come on, if I'm doing something that is going to eventually kill me or hurt me or, or I'm trying to fill a void with something that it's never gonna fill, if you love me, please tell me. But the hired, now the hireling flees because he merely serves for wages. Because in the moral economy, you pay me, I'll do this, but when the going gets tough, I'm gonna get going. And is not himself concerned about the sheep, cares nothing for them, but Jesus says this, it's so beautiful, but I, I am the good shepherd, and I know and recognize my own, and, and my own know and recognize me. So if the spirit of error exposes itself through the fruit that it bears, the spirit of truth will sustain you through an ever-growing knowledge of his voice. It's such, a, it's such a fun journey when you take out condemnation. See, when you take out condemnation and you don't view God as the one who's got this cosmic scoreboard up there Oh, you had a bad day. That's the demerit. That's a check mark. Dude, I had a fifth grade teacher, Miss Johnson, and she kept check marks up. I was always the leader. You get hands down. I had more check marks than any. I was, anyway. Check marks are not good. And that's how we view God sometimes. But my Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Because of what Jesus did for you on the cross, God put all that wrath and anger on the shoulders of Jesus, and that's where we get grace. See, that's truth too. We love that, yes. The ever-growing knowledge of Christ gets really exciting when you take condemnation off the table. And you start viewing this book as a love letter from God. Just a love, like, just a love letter. And you begin to hear the true voice of God. Say, hey, Jason, I love you so much. I, you know what? You're gonna make it. And I'm, and then you, know, you start telling God about things. And, yeah, but God, I did this, I did that. You know, and how do I get over? I mean, and God's like, what are you talking about? 
I don't remember that. I have cast that sin as far as the east is from the west. Let's talk about where we're going, not where we've been. Jesus wants to talk about where we're going, not, not where you've been, because you're a new creation. You got a blank canvas now. Come on, let's get the new colors out. And let's let, let's let the author and perfecter of our faith finish the story, because it's his story. But that starts by giving your life to him. That starts by confessing that you believe for yourself that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that God, he did come in the flesh, that he did live a sinless life, that he did take our death and sin, that he was dead for three days, and he did come back to life, and he is seated at the right hand of God, praying for you and I today, and he is coming back for us one day. But no one can do that for you. That's called faith. That's called you put your faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, if I could put your faith in Jesus for you and sprinkle you with some stuff, you know, then yeah, we'd all be fishing right now. No, I'm just kidding. Man, I just so want everyone to hear the journey is an adventure. And he wants, he wants to lead you in knowing his voice. The only way we're gonna make it through the craziness and gnarliness of the next 10, 20, 30 years, the only way our children are, are gonna grow up and know Jesus and the truth is if we begin to recognize the voice of truth. Bow your heads with me. Maybe you're here today, you say, Pastor Jason, I've never been saved. I've never given my heart to Jesus. I've never asked Jesus into my heart. Or maybe you're here and you can't point to a moment in time. You say, well, you know, I think I did, but I'm not sure. Well, I ask this question every week. And my only responsibility before God is to ask it. I don't ask you this question, I don't want a response out of you, whether you're online or in this room, out of emotion, because any decision made in emotion can be lost in emotion. Now I'm asking you, is there, is there a watchman at the door of your heart? That watchman in that story is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to open the door of your heart so that you can walk through the door who is Jesus Christ into abundance, into eternal life. If you confess and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. Here's how that looks. We confess and acknowledge that Jesus, that we, we wanna do that by raising our hands and then I will lead you in a prayer of faith. So here's the question, do you need to be saved? And if you do, slip your hand up right now. Yeah, yeah, yes. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, thank you. Yeah. How awesome is that? If you raised your hand or you're watching online and you know there's a void in you that you've tried to fill that it's just not, it's not happening. Jesus put that void there and only he can fill it. Pray this prayer with me. Nothing special about me and nothing magical about these words. I'm just putting some verbiage here for you to put your faith in Jesus. But pray this prayer right where you're at. God, thank you for loving me so much that you sent your only son to die for me. And right now I'm confessing that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. I believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. I believe that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. He was placed in a tomb. He was dead for three days and he came back to life. I believe that with my own heart now. This is my belief. It's my faith and I'm putting it in Jesus. I'm acknowledging him as my savior. 
Thank you for your love, God. Thank you for your grace and thank you for your mercy that's led me to this point. And thank you that therefore there is now no condemnation from you to me because I'm now in, I'm hidden in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, have you got saved? Awesome. Stand up with me. If you raise your hand, go to one of the corners upstairs or these corners down here and tell someone you gave your heart to the Lord. We'll get you a Bible, we'll get you a devotion, we'll hook you up with somebody. Prayer team's coming forward if you need prayer for anything. Hey, may the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you and everything you do this week prosper. I love you. I love you, I love you. Have a great afternoon.